Uh, welcome friends and today we are going to discuss the third lecture in the second module of uniform flow that is design of irrigation and stormwater channels. So essentially this uh, lecture would involve application of all previous uh, discussions that is we discussed what is uniform flow, what are the establishment of uniform flow, velocity distribution in case of an open channel. Uh, then it will come to the computation of normal depth, the geometric properties of the section and all resistance equations. So all that has been summed up and that has been applied to design uh, a irrigation channel, a strong water channel and a hydraulic efficient channel section. So these are our learning objectives. And uh, to begin with, we have basically, uh, there are two kinds of channels as we discussed in the very first lecture. There are prismatic and non-prismatic channels. There are rigid boundary and mobile boundary channels. So our focus would be to design a non-erodible channel that is essentially a line or a prismatic channel will not venture into non-prismatic part. So uh, what is non-erodible channels? Now, usually most of the channels that are built uh, which are mostly lined that is uh, provided with some uh, artificial lining that is concrete, brick or other materials. They are designed such a way that they can withstand the erosion and thus they are called as non-erodible channels. So the materials won't erode. Uh, the slope of the canal is based on the local topography that is the ground conditions and also on the desired elevations from the head of the canal to the tail of the canal and the type of the lining that will determine the roughness of the channel. Uh, now the channel uh, design essentially involves to determine the cross section properties of the channel and uh, which can effectively convey the dis required discharge. So canals are usually designed to convey the water to the field. So from dam there is X amount of discharge being released. Now to cater that X amount of discharge what channel dimension should be required that is what the channel design is all about so if it is a trapezoidal channel you have to design the side slope you have to design the bottom width you have to design the flow depth and likewise other these geometric uh, properties the principle of uh, design of non erodible channels uh, or which are also called the rigid boundary channels is to maintain such a velocity that the sediment will all in the suspension would not settle to the boundary and yet that velocity is small enough that it does not cause damage to the lining. So such a velocity is called non-silting, non-scouring velocity. So the velocity won't silt the uh, bed material, neither it won't uh, scour it. So uh, usually the purpose of lining is uh, most cases to prevent erosion but also it works as a check to the seepage losses because uh, let us say this is a non this is an unlined canal so from water from here can seep out so that check is provided by uh, minimizing the seepage losses so that is one of the very important functions of lining second is that it will also prevent erosion otherwise this unlined canal in longer run may erode so that will also prevent erosion. So there are various types of lining materials available and the uh, most common is a concrete lining. So here you can see that they are using this precast concrete uh, blocks. Otherwise you can do cast in C2 as well. So after ground preparation, they are making this trapezoidal section and here they are using this brick lining. So you can see these bricks are used here. So this brick lining is used for lining channel so these are the different kinds of uh, lining and apart from that there are some other materials like hdp and all which are available now coming to the design considerations now there are several parameters where we have to consider while designing a canal so the very first is the canal section that which section to be adopted so usually in practice a trapezoidal section is adopted however rectangular sections are adopted only in special situations where there are rock cuts. So in rock cuts, it is difficult to cut a trapezoidal section where there are uh, steep shoots. So where the steepness is very high, there also we cannot easily, you know, uh, construct the trapezoidal section or in cross drainage works. Now, what are cross drainage works? So this figure is an example of cross drainage works. So 
क्रॉस ड्रेनेज वर्क एसेंशियली इज समवॉट एनालॉगस टू लेट से if a road is going and there is a railway line going so one will cross over the other so similarly the cross drainage work either it can the road can be beneath or road can be above the railway line so it can be overpass or underpass similarly in hydraulics if a river and canal they they are crossing each other then how that passage is provided that is called a cross drainage work so in this figure you can see that the river is flowing in this direction and the canal which is at a higher elevation than the river uh, that in the hfl of the river that is a high flood level of the river so the canal is taken over the top so this is the canal and this is your river so they are at uh, perpendicular to each other so i have marked two points that is one and two so at one you can see your the canal section is rectangular while at two you can see that there is this expansion in the canal section and it again becomes trapezoidal so wherever the cross drainage work is provided we uh, convert that uh, section into rectangular obviously we maintain the consideration that it should provide the same discharge while maintaining all other parameters and only the cross section properties change for this shorter span of length so this is what a cross drainage work refers and this work where your canal is uh, above the river that is called an aqueduct the opposite case where canal is below the river that is called a super passage so that is also available so more in details you may study in hydraulic structures and all but this was a general outline now what side slope should be provided so generally the side slope would depend upon the angle of repose of your natural soil because uh, angle of repose is that uh, the angle at which your soil particles remain stable so that will depend upon the soil whether it is a clay soil or sandy soil or a mix of clay and sand while the values of m usually range between 1 to 1.5 and it can rarely go up to 2 but ideal range is 1 to 1.5 that is the side slope to be provided the next design consideration is a longitudinal slope now the longitudinal slope uh should be uh, is governed by the physiography that is uh, how the land is sloping whether the land is uh, having very steep slopes or cuts and based on that it will uh, entail the longitudinal slope however we should also uh, adhere to the limiting velocity constraints if the slope is too steep too steep the velocities would be very high and that flow can no longer remain uniform flow it may become you know some kind of a super critical flow that will uh, understand when we go to the critical flow part so usually the sl slopes are of the order of 0.001 and the for line canals the permissible velocity or usually it is recommended as 2 meters per second so that is the velocity which is recommended for line canal uh, so here we can see there is a table which is given where it uh, enlists that for different soil types what uh, side slope should be adopted so this is a guide which can help us in selecting the side slope so let us say if you are given uh that the canal is being constructed through rocky strata then you can select um, a suitable m value so usually you can select the average of these two so this value you can select also the permissible velocities have been given that uh, what kind of uh, boundary let us say mostly you if you use concrete so concrete channel the maximum permissible velocity is 6 meters per second if you use a brick masonry you can uh, go with 2.5 or 4 meter per second same for hard rock so depending upon the type of boundary this permissible velocity has to be adhered to again coming to the roughness we already discussed when we are discussing the roughness coefficient so if you are taking a concrete channel with the different conditions that let us say it is uh, having good finish then your manning zone can range between this if it is having little bit poor finish then the manning zone would vary if you are using a brick uh, lining then manning zone would vary so uh, for con sievers that is uh, the circular section where you use concrete asbestos cement or vitrified clay the value is much lower so it is more smoother so this is how uh, the roughness can be determined so these parameters again will help you in design of channel now the next important parameter is the fraud number so fraud number Uh, that is uh, computed as f is equal to v upon under root g y 
so that is for a rectangular channel so the fraud number computation is essential and you should uh, consider that fraud number should be as low as possible because at higher fraud numbers there will be a lot of disturbance in the surface even though the canal section is straight you can observe a lot of disturbances and wavy nature at high fraud uh, number so usual range is between 0.3 to 0.4 so whenever you design you should check whether your fraud is within permissible limits or not uh, next is the uh, permissible velocities now uh, the cost of the canal depends upon its size that is the dimension and the slope which is uh, you know uh, permitted as per the topographic conditions so it is always economical to use high velocities but that should be safe so that the water travels quickly because if we provide too high velocities then there is a risk of scour and erosion but if the velocities are too low then there is a risk of deposition of suspended matter so as i indicated earlier it should be non non silting non scouring velocity i mean unlined canals uh, if there is a too low velocity, it could encourage weed growth as well. So, uh, in case of irrigation channels, the minimum velocity has to be adhered to that is 0.3 meters per second. And the maximum velocity you saw in the table, if it is a concrete line channel, it has to be 6 meters per second. Now, uh, another important consideration is freeboard. So, what is freeboard? We'll understand. Now, freeboard is a vertical distance between the full supply level to the top of lining. So here you can see this is the lining material. This is the lining and this is the full supply level. Full supply level means that the channel is uh, the canal is designed to run at that particular depth to carry the required discharge. So at any case, your canal will never in general case let us say if there is uh, too much rainfall or addition of discharge from side then it may spill but in general case your full supply level has to be maintained so the canal lining is given little bit higher than that so this distance uh, vertical distance is a freeboard now freeboard uh, is uh, usually provided to uh, such that the canal section is safe during a wave action due to heavy winds there may be some wave actions so the lining will be able to resist that uh, and there will not be any scouring of the bank so that is why the uh, free board is provided and up to this part the water uh, can easily splash the lining so the am amount of free board would depend upon the canal size its location the velocity and the depth of flow to be adopted okay so this is the typical line canal section Now freeboard considerations are if your discharge is less than 10 meters per sec uh, meter cube per second for a line canal freeboard should be 0 0.6 meter and uh, in other case uh, here there is a type over it it should be greater than uh, 10 meter uh, cube per second it should be 0 0.75 meter okay so that is the uh, freeboard considerations now after all this discussion the ultimate uh, thing comes to be the economy. So the economy would demand that your cost of excavation and the lining would be as low as possible. So this particular aspects leads us to study that most efficient or hydraulically efficient channel sections. For such sections, you will have lower uh, excavation and lining cost. So let us move to the most or hydraulically efficient channel section. Now, uh, the Manning's equation and continuity equation will yield us Q is equal to 1 by N, A R raised to 2 by 3, S naught raised to half. So let us rephrase. So Q is equal to A raised to 5 by 3, S naught raised to half upon N P raised to 2 by 3. We are substituting R is equal to A by P. So if the values of N and S naught are given, your discharge will be maximum for a given cross section area when your wetted perimeter is minimum. Okay, so such a cross section where your wetted perimeter is minimum for a given cross section area is known as the hydraulically efficient channel section or the best section. Now, remember this principle of best hydraulic section applies to design of non erodible channels only. If you want to go for erodible channels, 
you have to consider the principle of attractive force in that case. Now, uh, what is the implication of minimum weighted perimeter? Minimum weighted perimeter that implies to the length. So that will minimize your uh, length of your lining. So ultimately the cost will come down. So if we rephrase the previous equation, your in terms of P, so P is equal to S naught raised to three by four upon Q N raised to three by two into A raised to five by two. So P one is equal to K one into A raised to five by two where your K one is this uh, constant part. So as you can see that if P is minimum, your cross section area will be minimum because they are directly proportional. Again, the volume of excavation will be minimum. The length of lining will be minimum and that would yield the lower uh, project cost. That brings us to our first discussion of this uh, lecture that going by the geometrical properties, what do you think which section will be most efficient? That is for a given cross section area, it will have the least weighted perimeter. So just explore we have in the last class discussed all the cross section shapes from that just think that geometrically which section will be most efficient second based on the relationship uh, between discharge uh, between weighted perimeter and other parameters what is your comment on the relationship between conveyance and weighted perimeter so if we say that if the weighted perimeter decreases would the conveyance decrease or conveyance increase so that relationship you can you have to think of that how these two vary because conveyance is your discharge carrying capacity per unit longitudinal slope. So now we would derive the most efficient triangular section. So remember the geometric properties of a most efficient uh, section is different from those which we derived earlier. Okay, because here our cons consideration is a minimum weighted perimeter. So this is your section. This is your uh, depth of flow and this is your side slope one is to M and this is your water surface. So the area for a uh, usual triangular section is given as a is equal to m y square. So in terms of y that is equal to under root a by m. Now weighted perimeter p is equal to 2y under root m square plus 1. So let us substitute this y here. So that is 2 into under root a by m into under root m square plus 1. So if we uh, square the equation on both the sides and um, simplify it, we'll get p square is equal to 4 into m plus 1 by m into a. So this is our uh, equation. Now uh, we derived that for most efficient section, the weighted perimeter should be minimum. So that constraint we get it as dp by dm is equal to 0. So to have the minimum weighted perimeter, the dp by dm that is differentiate above equation will get with respect to m. So it becomes 2p dp by dm is equal to 4 minus 4 by m square into a. Now that is equal to 0. So all this term becomes 0. So you have 4 minus 4 upon m square is equal to 0 and m is equal to 9. So uh, sorry m is equal to 1. So that means your theta is equal to 90 degree. So a triangular section with a central angle of 90 degree is the most efficient section. So if you have a theta any other theta uh, theta any other than 90 degree it will not be an efficient section so hydraulic radius r that is equal to y upon 2 root 2 since your m is equal to 1 so it is y upon 2 root 2 so for a most efficient triangular section this is your uh, uh, geometric properties so with the help of that can you prove that semicircular section is the most efficient cross section so the hint is just see this figure in triangular section and the inscribed semicircle whether it suffi uh, suffices the criteria that it will be the most efficient cross section now let us derive the most efficient rectangular section so the catch is the construction is simple you have area is equal to b into y so you will substitute b is equal to a by y now in weighted perimeter equation you will substitute the value of b so that will give you p is equal to a by y plus 2y. Now for most efficient section, your dp by dy is 0. So on solving it, you get a is equal to 2y square and b is equal to 2y. So if we rewrite this equation, that means the most efficient rectangular section is 1 where your depth 
is half of its width. That is your most efficient rectangular section. Now the sufficient suffix e is for the most efficient rectangular section properties. So that is how it differentiates from your regular uh, geometric properties with the suffix e. Uh, with the subscript e, sorry. So the hydraulic radius is given by r is equal to y by 2. So for the most efficient section, r is equal to y by 2. Now lastly, we will derive for the most efficient trapezoidal section. So uh, you can see the diagram. Your slope is uh, 1 is to m. This is the width. Uh, and this is your depth. So your area is B uh, plus MY into Y. So B is equal to A by Y minus MY. So the very simple geometric, uh, very simple mathematical steps uh, from derived from the geometry. P is equal to B plus 2Y under, under root M square plus 1. So substituting the value of B here. And uh, you get this equation number 10. Now, here what we'll do, we'll keep a and m is constant and will differentiate the equation with respect to y. So that yields a by y square minus 2 under root m square uh, plus 1 plus m that is equal to 0. And on simplifying this, we get b is equal to 2y under root m square plus 1 minus m. So substituting that in top width, top width is b plus 2my. So you get top width is equal to 2y under root m square plus 1. Now we'll derive the hydraulic radius as well. So your hydraulic radius for the most efficient trapezoidal section is y by 2. So I'm not going into detail. It is simple substitution. That is y by 2. Now we want to find what is the efficient uh, side slope. So if we see the We'll, so we'll derive the weighted, uh, differentiate the weighted perimeter with respect to m. So dp by dm is equal to 0. So on substituting and uh, simplifying, we get m is equal to 1 by root 3 or theta is equal to 60 degree. So for a most efficient uh, trapezoidal section, your side slope should be 1 by root 3. So with the help of this, can, uh, it becomes uh, a point of discussion that show that the best hydraulic trapezoidal section is one half of a hexagon. So using the geometrical properties of hexagon, you can prove whether your best hydraulic trapezoidal section is one half of a hexagon. Now this table summarizes the uh, most efficient uh, channel section properties. That is if it is a rectangular section, what will be the area, wetted perimeter, hydraulic uh, radius, top width. Last uh, column is a constant which is unique for each channel shape. So it is uh, based on this formula. So that is not as important, but other properties are important. That is next is a triangle trapezoidal for half hexagon uh, triangular with vertex angle 90 degree circular that is semicircular. So these all uh, properties you can derive also and they are just uh, summarized here for your reference. Now we'll see what are the steps to be followed when you design a non-erodible channel or a line channel. So first step is collect all information that is what is the discharge required to be carried by the channel, what is the material from where you can get roughness and what is the longitudinal slope on which it is to be laid. Then you will compute the channel geometrical properties, you will compute the normal depth, you will compute the B, you will compute the M as the case is. Then you will compute the velocity of flow. Next is to check whether the velocity is in the permissible limits. That is the minimum and the maximum limits. Again, check for the fraud number. Now, if the velocity is not in permissible limits, that will uh, directly yield a higher fraud number. So then you have to redesign the channel section. How you will rede re re redesign it? Let us say if your permissible velocity is 6 meters per second and you get the answer as 8 meter per second. So what you do, you go for reverse calculation. So take V is equal to 6 meters per second and then go back and, you know, uh, try to figure out what are the, because you have the flow. So you will get the area, area. And based on that, uh, you find out what is the B and Y and then again perform a, uh, the computations. Then you have to suggest a suitable freeboard depending upon the discharge. 
and then you provide a final channel section. So your channel section, you have to give as a diagram where you should mention all the properties that this is your depth and based on free board, this is your length of lining, this is your width, this is your side slope. And that is how you will design the entire channel section. So moving ahead, uh, the next part is the design of stormwater drains. So let us understand what is stormwater drains and what are the what are its purposes. So the design of stormwater and sanitary sewers. So sanitary sewers are one which carries the wastewater that det involves determination of partly full capacity for a given uh, design depth or the normal depth for a given discharge. So usually circular conduits are adopted for the stormwater and uh, sanitary sewers. Now the design is based how we compute the discharge. So for sanitary sievers, the discharge is determined by the population estimate and the wastewater rates per capita, which are for different developing uh, conditions. And for the stormwater sievers, uh, the hydraulic calculations involve the peak runoff rate computation due to a storm event. Based on that, you compute the discharge. Now, since the pressurized flow is avoided, especially in sanitary sievers, now you have to select the conduit size where the partly flow conditions would uh, cater to the design discharge. Even for the storm sievers, uh, the full flow conditions are undesirable. Um, so we'll always go with the partly flow conditions. Now you might have observed uh, why this uh, pressurized flow conditions are undesirable because when your Y by D ratio nears one, the air access to free surface is reduced with intermittent opening and closing of the section. So such a condition is referred to as slugging. So this slugging condition that uh, results into formation of air pocket, the crown of the pipe. So that is at the top of the pipe that is called crown where it uh, forms this air pocket and that could damage the pipe joints and could cause undesirable fluctuations in the discharge. So that is why the full conditions are avoided uh, in this case. Now you might have also observed that the wetted perimeter increases more rapidly as uh, than the cross section area when you are near the crown of the pipe and that would cause a reduction in the discharge capacity. So for uh, the curve where we see the normal depth, uh, it reaches a maximum value in AR by A that is uh, for the given section factor. And so the y by d would decrease as it approaches one. So this curve can show that y by d would decrease as it approaches one. So at that particular point, you may have two possible normal depths near the crown. So this is a crown and the upper one is likely to occur with without slugging or filling the pipe. So that is why uh, when you cross a certain limit that is y by d is equal to 0.8, you go above it you may encounter multiplicity of normal depths and that could cause your slugging condition. That is why it has to be avoided. So understanding some pipe terminologies. So the top level that is called the crown level. So this is the crown level and the in inner level that is called the invert level. So the crown level is invert level plus your thickness. So this is your thickness. This is your in, in uh, internal diameter of the pipe. Outer diameter is internal diameter plus two times the thickness and this is your flow depth. So these are the terminologies in case of a circular section. So this is the same graph which we discussed uh, previously. That is a ratio of Q by Q full to and V by V full to the ratio of Y by D. So that is the uh, variation being shown. So design of stormwater sewer involves determination of diameter longitudinal slopes and the crown and invert elevations. So these elevations also you need to determine for each pipe in the system. So let us understand how your discharge is arrived at. So this is a schematic for uh, your uh, open stormwater system. So you can see due to rainfall, the water is being collected and it will flow over the ground and then it is uh, transported through pipes. So let us say there are different communities so from uh, one uh, area, the discharge that is coming as Q1 from another area, it is coming Q2 from another area Q3. These three discharge um, gets accumulated at one uh, place that is called catch basin. From that it travels further 
uh, to the outfall. So this point is called outfall. So outfall is generally a river or a lake or a sea as the condition may be. So at, from the catch basin, the total discharge traveling this pipe, that is summation of Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. So when you are designing this pipe, so your diameter will be based on this discharge Q4. For other pipes, it will be based on their respective discharge. Now this is a manhole which is generally provided at the junction of more than one pipe where there, or when there is change in the slope of pipes or when there is uh, some uh, maintenance or required or change in the direction of pipes. So there this manhole is provided. If we look at the plan, so there are four uh, areas or four uh, plots. So this is area A1, A2, area A3, A4. So from area A1, you have a peak runoff that is the overland flow discharge. So whatever rain is falling over this area, it will generate this discharge that is QP1. Here it will be QP2. So this is a manhole provided that is your inlet of the pipe. So this is pipe 1. So the total discharge that the upstream condition that is the summation of QP1 and QP2. So for pipe 1, whatever diameter D1 you arrive at, that will be based on this discharge Q1 that is flowing in the pipe. Uh, now for the next... Uh, point that is MH2 that is a manhole 2. The discharge coming is the overland flow QP3, overland flow QP4 from area A4 and the whatever discharge is there in the pipe 1 that is Q1. So the total discharge at this point is Q1 plus QP3 plus QP4 and the Q2 discharge will flow from uh, in the pipe 2 and based on that you will determine the diameter D2 and the final it will flow at the outfall O1. So for like that, you will arrive at the discharge and how the discharge is arrived. The discharge is arrived uh, using a rational formula that is a well-known formula in hydrology. So that is used to compute the peak runoff rate from an urban catchment. So that is given by QP is equal to 1 upon 3.6 CIA. So QP is your peak discharge in meter cube per second. C is a runoff coefficient that will depend upon the type of ground. So if there is a building or a concrete area, it will yield more runoff. If there is a grass area, it will yield less runoff. Uh, I is the rainfall intensity in millimeters per hour and A is the catchment area in kilometers square. Now there is one very important point while applying this equation. If you are applying this equation, you should always convert the quantities in this unit. Let us see if I have given area in hectares convert into kilometer square and then only input in this equation. Otherwise, you will get wrong answers because this is an empirical equation. So this factor 3.6 is placed such that it takes into, into consideration different units. Similarly, for rainfall, it is provided in other units. You have to convert in mm per hour. Then only you will get uh, this discharge in meter cube per second. So once you compute the peak runoff rate, so you have to take into consideration what is the ground cover. So for roof, building roof, it will yield more runoff because there is less infiltration. So the runoff value is higher. Similarly, if you have gardens or forest, the runoff value is lower. Again, the permissible velocity criteria in gravity sievers, the minimum is 0.6 meter per second. So that is you have to ma maintain it and the maximum is 3 meter per second. Now, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration a couple of more points. That is the sievers are joined at junctions such that the crown elevation of upstream is no lower than the downstream sever. So let us say this is one sever, this is second sever. So the crown elevations should be such that the upstream sever, the crown elevation is not lower. Let us say the upstream sever is this and the downstream is this. So you should not have that mismatch. Second, at any junction or manhole, the downstream sewer cannot be smaller than the upstream sewer. So let us say the uh, upstream sewer is 2 meter diameter and the downstream sewer is 1.9 meter diameter. So that is not allowed. So upstream sewer, uh, downstream sewer should never be lower in diameter than the upstream sewer. That brings us to the discussion why. Let us say if the conditions permit you, then also why the size reduction cannot be possible in the downstream. So that is a question you have to answer. Coming to the last part, that steps for the design of stormwater drain. So what is the first step? 
you compute the peak discharge using the rational formula from each area and then you can compute the total discharge which is entering at the inlet point then based on that discharge you will compute the diameter of the circular pipe which is required to uh, carry the, that discharge and for a given bed slope now let us say if your diameter comes out to be 1.12 now so that is not a commercially available diameter because in field you have to adopt a diameter which can be uh, available so for that this table will help you so this uh, is from indian standard code that is is 458 2003 that gives you the sizes of commercially available pipe diameter so let us say uh, i get a diameter of 143 millimeters so that is not commercially available so i'll go for the next higher size that is 150 millimeters so like that you have to select the higher diameter size based on that you compute the velocity of flow check whether the velocity is in permissible limits if the velocity is too high then uh, adopt another uh, higher diameter or you can increase the number of barrels number of barrels means let us say upstream there is only one pipe section coming now if in the downstream if discharge is too high and you cannot go for a more larger commercially available diameter let us say higher diameter is three meters you don't have more than that then what you do you divide it into two pipes so your discharge will be half and based on that you compute the discharge and uh, adopt the diameter now remember that when you are taking two barrels your diameter should not be less than the upstream diameter so that again consideration applies here also so perform similar analysis for all pipes so let us say your network has five pipes repeat all steps and uh, design uh, the diameter of all pipes check for the velocity and move that way the last step is compute the elevation of invert as well as cro crown using the design diameter and existing ground level and ground cover condition now since the circular sievers are beneath the ground so there is a minimum ground cushion provided such that the sievers can resist the action of uh, you know uh, the vehicles and other so usually that is 0.9 meter below the ground surface that is provided uh, as mentioned in the cpheo manual so this table would provide you the idea of the pipe diameters that are commercially available and their thickness so with this we complete our discussion and i hope with the help of this discussion you will be able to design a line uh, irrigation canal as well as storm water channels so thank you very much in the next class we'll begin with a new module that is um, critical flow and we will discuss further on that aspects of the critical flow so thank you everyone and have a nice day